Well, last Sunday was the first Sunday of the year, brand new calendar. This Sunday, obviously, is the second sun, uh, Sunday of the year. We are still very new in this year, and uh, we're just going to continue what we started last Sunday, this series of sermons entitled, Rest in the New Year, Resting in the Sovereignty of God. Last Sunday, we began to look at this subject, and uh, from what we see going on in these, these first couple of weeks of this new year, uh, we may have ahead of us the same kind of year that uh, we've had for the last two years. So there's probably going to be some challenges uh, that lie ahead. Uh, I said this last Sunday, I still believe it. I believe there's a lot of people that's just tired, that's just wore out uh, from all that uh, we got to do these, these, this, this time in which we're at in, in human history. So uh, hopefully through the, the, the preaching and teaching and study of God's Word, we can see what it means to rest in God's sovereignty. We can learn how to rest in God's sovereignty. And uh, we can get it from here to here, where we really, truly rest in God and His sovereignty. You know, sadly, when the lives of many followers of Christ are examined, when we really watch what we're doing and not just hear what we're saying, we come to the conclusion that we talk a big game, uh, but when it's time to follow, when it's time to rest, when it's time to give it to Him, we don't always do that. Matter of fact, we, uh, we're real good at just kind of trying to take over when we should be trusting the Lord, amen or not. We have a, have a tendency to just kind of say, okay, God, won't you just move over a little bit and uh, I'll, I'll take control of this situation. And when we do that, we crash and burn, don't we, guys? We just do because we can't do what God can do. And we're not called to do what he can do. He hasn't equipped us that way. He hasn't gifted us that way. So we need to be resting in his sovereignty more times than not. We catch ourselves acting like those old deists that we talked about last Sunday. We catch ourselves uh, acting like, yeah, God created this, and, and, and God uh, is the one who uh, brought everything into being, but when he got her wound up, he just drifted off into space, and he's no longer interested. He's no longer active. It's kind of, if it's to be, it's up to me. And boy, that is totally unbiblical. That is not what we see in scriptures. Um, God does interact with us daily. God does uh, intervene in our lives daily. Uh, and God does orchestrate what's going on in our lives every day. God wasn't just present at creation. God is present with his creation. Amen or not? He wasn't just there when he said, let there be light. He wasn't just there when he separated the firmaments. God is present now and God is very active and orchestrating things in our lives every day. Now, last Sunday, we went from Genesis 1, which is the creation account, up to about Genesis 12, where God, uh, again, in his sovereignty, uh, called a man out of the world, a man named Abram, and uh, he gave Abram some directions, but he also made a covenant of promises to Abram. And so we're going to kind of pick up uh, not exactly there, but a little further on down the line. You know, God is a God of relationships. How many of you know that? Here's what God created you for, to have a loving relationship with him. To have a loving relationship with him. And when we study scripture, we see God's sovereignty the most in how he deals with his crowning creation which is mankind. God is still very much interested in intervening in our situations daily. God's still interested very much in orchestrating things in our lives. Watch this, not for your glory, for his glory. How many of y'all have lived long enough to know that life isn't about you? Let that sink in. <clears throat> well, preacher, where'd you get that from? I mean, I, I think life's all about me. Well, we do make life all about us, don't we? But that isn't the reason that God created you and me. He created you and me for His glory. So life's not all about us. But God is actively directing. God is actively allowing. God is actively not allowing things into our lives. 
God is the causation of all things, and God also prevents things. So God's not just a God of creation. God is a God that is with uh, the creation. Every day in your life and mine, God is busy orchestrating things in our lives that will bring glory to his name. All those things we don't consider good, by the way. Matter of fact, more times than not, we probably consider them not so good. Uh, they're sometimes uncomfortable. Sometimes we find our places in, ourselves in places where we don't want to be. In Genesis chapter 12, where we left off last Sunday, we're not going to pick up there today, but God made this covenant with Abraham, and two of the things, two of the promises in that covenant uh, was this. First of all, he told Abraham that he was going to make him, Abraham, into a great nation. He's done that. The nation of Israel is from the loins of Abraham. You talk to a, a Jewish person, and that Jewish person will call Abraham Father Abraham. So he's done that in the nation Israel. He also said this in this promise. He said, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. That's your family, and that's my family. In this covenant, these promises, he said, all of the families of earth will be blessed through you. Well, how so? Well, because the Lord Jesus Christ, his lineage traces right back Father Abraham, our Savior, is a Jewish Savior. And so the families of earth are blessed because the forgiveness and the salvation that God offers through his son, Jesus Christ, is available to all the families of the earth. That's how we're blessed. So Abraham had a couple of sons. You probably remember them. He had two sons, one named Ishmael and one named Isaac. Isaac carried on the line of the Jews uh, all the way to Christ and beyond. Ishmael is uh, the father of some, not all, but some of the Arab nations. Uh, that may or may not mean anything to you, but that's the way it is. Isaac went on to have a couple of sons that you probably remember named Esau and Jacob, set of twins. Jacob, who's also called Israel, Jacob had 12 sons, and from those 12 sons come the 12 tribes of Israel that still exist, even though they, they, yeah, they probably know what tribe they're from over in Israel. So the youngest one of Jacob's sons, uh, not the youngest, but the, the next to the youngest, at, at, the, at the point where we're going to pick up this story, he's the youngest, but he has a brother later on in life. Um, Jacob has a son that you probably uh, was taught about in Sunday school, a guy named Joseph. You remember the story of the coat of many colors? Sure you do. Well, Joseph lived a life away from his family for most of his life, and uh, it was outside of his choosing. He didn't choose to do that. Um, but in this story that I'm going to run you through, and when I say that, I'm going to fast forward this story, this saga, by telling you what happened from Genesis about, uh, I don't know, 41, 40, on up to verse chapter 45. I'm going to tell you what happened. But in this story, we see the sovereign hand of God, and we don't get to see it until the end. We see things that happens in Joseph's life that are, man, absolutely horrible, absolutely tragic things that we would never want to go through, but, but God sovereignly not only allowed him to go through them, caused him to go through them. I want you to let that sink in. If you're a believer here this morning, if you're following Jesus Christ, I want you to think of that thought that, that God could potentially allow his children to go through some things that are hard, that are unpleasant, man, that are horrible. God could allow that. Then I want you to think a step further. Not only could God allow that, but God could actually cause that in our lives. Man, I, I, don't, I don't want to think that away, Brother Trace. That, that's not the way I see God. Well, you might need to. You might need to because in order to rest in his sovereignty, that's what we've got to understand is who our God is and what life is really all about. So in Genesis 37, Joseph, uh, the youngest of Jacob's children up to this point, he is, he is loved the most by his father. Joseph was a child of Jacob's old age, and 
Therefore, the Bible says that Jacob loved Joseph the most. He had 12 other sons and some daughters, but of all of his kids, he loved Joseph the most. Joseph didn't choose that. The Bible doesn't indicate that Joseph set out to win his father's affections. The Bible just says that Jacob loved Joseph the most. You remember the story of the coat of many colors. That was to show his love for Joseph. None of the other kids got a coat like that. And so the story picks up in the saga, because it really is a saga. It picks up here in Genesis 37. And the first thing we know, Joseph's brothers in, in chapter 37 have captured him, and they have thrown him down into a well. The Bible says that they left him there with the intentions of letting him die. But Reuben, one of the older brothers, had a little bit of a conscience. So they come back and they fished Joseph out of that well, chapter 37, and they sold him to a band of Midianite gypsies. They were gypsies, my word. You don't see that word in the Bible. They sold him to this caravan that was traveling, was headed toward Egypt. Probably you're familiar with the story. Chapter 39, this caravan who just bought Joseph sells him again, and he's sold into the house of an Egyptian uh, captain named Potiphar. Probably you're familiar with that. Potiphar's wife takes notice of Joseph. She makes advances toward Joseph, but Joseph will have none of that. And that lands him some time in prison. She makes accusations about Joseph that he made advances toward her, so Potiphar throws him in prison. And he's there for a long time. Please forgive me, I lost my voice early this morning. <clears throat> so he, stands, he stays in prison for like 12 years, a long stint. While he's in prison, chapter 41, uh, or chapter 40, God gives him the gift to interpret dreams. And he does some of that. He interprets some dreams. In chapter 41, he actually interprets a dream for Pharaoh. Now, you know Pharaoh. He's the most powerful man in Egypt. So he interprets this dream for Pharaoh. And chapter 41, he literally saves the lives of all the Egyptians and all of the surrounding area because he warns Pharaoh of a coming famine. There's going to be a severe drought for seven long years. And so what Pharaoh does is he collects all of the grain and he saves it, all that he can buy up, and he saves it. Chapter 42, uh, Joseph's brothers comes to see not what they think is their brother, but they simply come to Egypt to buy grain. Now, by this time, because Joseph... Uh, interpreted the dream and saved all of Egypt and the surrounding areas, Pharaoh has elevated him to the second in command. He is right under Pharaoh in Egypt, Joseph is, the one who was thrown in the pit, the one who was sold into slavery, the one who was thrown in prison. Now, he's the second highest ranking official in all of Egypt. So his brothers come for the purpose of buying grain. That's why they come to Egypt. Their father, Israel, or Jacob, sends them to buy grain. And in chapter 42, they come before Joseph. Well, Joseph wasn't ready for that. <clears throat> Joseph could have never prepared himself for what he was about to face. All of the memories, all of the horror, all of the, the things that was done to him by his very own flesh and blood now is Throwed back into his memory, brought face to face in reality with the very ones who altered the course of his life. Joseph didn't have any say in that. He didn't have any choice in the matter. He didn't ask for any of it, but it happened to him. So here he is in verse 43, or chapter 43, he sends them back home with the grain. He sells them grain. They don't recognize Joseph because they haven't seen him in years and years, but he recognizes them. Sometimes you never forget people who do evil things to you, amen or not. Sometimes they're very hard to forget. Joseph recognized them right off, but they didn't recognize him. He was a boy when they did all that to him, and he's a grown man now. 
Not only a grown man, but he's living as an Egyptian. So in chapter 43, Joseph sends his brothers back with the grain and he tells them because he's been inquisitive while they're there. And he asked them about their father and he asked them about their family. And through this conversation, he finds out that Jacob has another boy, a little boy named Benjamin. And he tells them as they leave with the grain, <clears throat> if you ever come back to Egypt and you don't bring Benjamin, I'm going to kill all of you. They still don't know that it's Joseph. So as you move forward, they have to come back again for more grain, to buy more grain from Egypt. And in chapter 45, where you're at, where I've told you to go, Genesis chapter 45, we're going to pick up the story right there. I've, I've just held the fast forward button down for you, but we're going to pick it up in real time now. This is the second time that his brothers have stood in front of him. It's an event that he could have never prepared himself for. Can you try to imagine this meeting? Can you try to imagine the tension that was in this room? Can you imagine the memories that are flooding back in Joseph's mind as uh, possibly when, when they grabbed hold of him and by the leg and the arm and the hair, and they threw him into that pit, and possibly he thought it was just a cruel joke, and he was waiting for them to come back, and he stayed there for so long that it kind of set in on him that my brothers put me here to die. And then he heard their footsteps as they reapproached later on, and the joy that must have come into his, his heart. Uh, my brothers are coming back. This is just all a joke. Uh, and they draw him out of that pit, but then they do something probably even worse. They sell him like a dog into a caravan. And then he travels to Egypt. And all these memories uh, at the sight of his brothers have to be flooding back into his mind. And so here they are in front of him. And look at Genesis 45 verse 1. <clears throat> you there? Say amen. The Bible says this, Then Joseph could not control himself. Before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He's about to reveal to his brothers who he is. They still don't know. And so he's about to reveal to his brothers who he is. Weeping, broken, he sends everybody out of the room. Bible says in verse 2, he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard of it or heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Wow. Can you imagine that? I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Couldn't believe it was him. Their thought was, Joseph is dead. We sold him into oblivion. He's, this can't be Joseph. Joseph's dead. This is after a lot of years, guys. But the truth of the matter is, Joseph is alive and he's standing before them. Verse 3, then Joseph said to my brothers, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer where their view would be more clear, where they could see his facial features, where they could recognize that, yeah, this is my little brother that we threw in the pit that we sold into slavery. This is him all grown up. He's now second in command over Egypt. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. Now, what we're fixing to read in verse 5 is really kind of un unthinkable. It really goes beyond <clears throat> our understanding how Joseph could say what he's about to say. Unless, unless we have reached that point in our life as we follow Christ, that we have learned to absolutely rest in the sovereignty of God. Not just giving it lip service, 
But we honestly believe and bank on the fact that God is sovereign and nothing happens outside of his divine will. Look at verse 5. Joseph says to his brothers, Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves. You understand that Joseph has the power in his position to step on these guys like a roach. With just one swipe of his fingers, these guys are no more. These guys who betrayed him, these guys who tried to murder him, these guys who lied to their father about him. But that's not what they say, is it? They, he says to them, do not be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. Now watch this. For God sent me before you to preserve life. He's not blaming them. I wonder how much better Christians' lives would be if we quit blaming other folks. You ever thought about that? How much better off would God people be if we quit pointing a finger at everybody? If we just realized that everything, listen to me, I said everything that happens in our lives, God either allows it or ordains it. Uh, there, is, there is nothing that slips by God. There's nothing that I'm going to face or experience in my life that my heavenly father doesn't okay. And so when Joseph in verse 5 says, look, don't grieve. Don't be angry with yourself. God sent me here. You didn't. No, Joseph, they did. Don't you remember? Surely you remember how they tore your clothes as you tried to run away from them. Surely you remember the, the darkness of that pit as you raced toward the bottom of it face first. Surely you remember that... You were full of joy when they came back because you thought they were coming to get you to take you home so you could wear your coat of many colors. But when they drug you out of there, they sold you like a dog. Surely you remember that, Joseph? Hey, yeah, he remembers that. Man, he'll never forget that. There's no way he could ever erase that from his memory banks. But he lives in rest in the sovereignty of God. He understands clearly that these evil brothers of mine, they didn't throw me in that pit. God did. Preacher, that does not even register with what I think about Christianity. Well, can I, can I pop your bubble? You're thinking wrongly about Christianity. Life ain't about you and life ain't about me. Life's about bringing glory to God. And you're going to see as this story winds down and we get to the end, this story about Joseph ain't about Joseph. The story about you is not about you. The story about me is not about me. The story's about God. We're just little parts of it. And he moves us around. He places us in situations. He exposes us to things for his glory that will work out in his glory. Let's keep reading. Are y'all all right? Verse 6. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. Verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant in the earth. What in the world is he talking about? God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant in the earth? These evil brothers are what makes up the 12 tribes of Israel. Are y'all all right? And those 12 tribes, out of those 12 tribes, come the Messiah, Jesus Christ, that saves the world from sins. God's plan. Preacher, are you trying to tell me that God would let that boy be thrown into a pit? Are you trying to tell me that God would let that boy be sold into slavery? Are you trying to tell me, preacher, that, that God would let an innocent man spend 12 years in prison? Look, God don't wear a watch and God ain't got no calendar. Twelve years ain't nothing to him. Yes, God would let us be in a pit for a while. Yes, God would let us be in slavery for a while. Yes, God would let us be in uh, prison for a while for his glory. And when we rightly understand who God is and our position in God and his sovereignty, we ought to rejoice in that. Preacher, I can't rejoice in the pit. I know it's hard, right? Preacher, I can't rejoice in slavery. Yeah, I know it's hard, right? I can't rejoice in prison. 
If you get your own self in there, you shouldn't. But if God allows you to go, you should. Because there's a much bigger picture than what you're looking at. Verse 7, now therefore it was not you, or verse 8, now therefore it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son, Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. And do not delay. Turn to chapter 50. So Joseph says to his brothers, go get daddy. Go get daddy and bring him to Egypt. I want to spend some time with dad. And when you get there, you tell him Joseph's still alive. And you tell him this, that God has made his son Joseph, Lord over all Egypt. And so they do that. And fast forwarding another few years, Joseph gets to live with Jacob for a while. They get to love on each other. Uh, He gets to know Benjamin. Life is once good. And then Jacob dies, an old, old man. Look at verse 14 of chapter 50. You there say amen. After... He buried his father after Joseph buried Jacob. Joseph returned to Egypt. He took his father back home and buried him. Then he come back to Egypt. He and his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge? By the way, we would, wouldn't we? Come on now. We'd probably bear a grudge, wouldn't we? He's thrown us in, we've been thrown in a pit, uh, we've been in prison, we've been in slavery, and it's all their fault. Chances are real good. We would carry a grudge. And they're worried about that, and, and they should be. What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a messenger to Joseph, or 16, saying, your father charged before we, he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin. For they did you wrong, and now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of God, of your father. And when Joseph wept, and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Now, if you're familiar with the story, you know that at the very beginning of the story, before he was ever thrown in the pit, one of the things that got him in the pit was a dream he had. And in this dream, it was a picture of his brothers bowing down before him. And here later on in life, we see that that dream has come true. And verse 18 says, the brothers came and fell down uh, before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But watch this. Verse 19. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for I am in God's place. What does that mean? Don't be afraid. I'm in God's place. This is what he would have said if he was from Arkansas. Don't be afraid. I'm right where God wants me. Are y'all all all right? Now listen to me. In our tragedies and in our circumstances, when life breaks us, when life rushes in and brings things into our life, man, that we don't want no part of, we didn't ask for, it ain't fair. If we rightly understand the sovereign hand of God, our speech would be like this. I don't like it. It ain't fair. It's not good. But God's got me right where he wants me. Listen, I understand this ain't popular preaching. I get it. Uh, But it's Bible preaching. It's understanding who God is and how we fit into his economy. 
when life collapses on us, if we are a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, if we belong to Jesus, we can say, this is hell. But God's got me right where he wants me. Because somehow through this, God's going to bring himself glory and God's going to rescue me from this. And even if he don't this side of eternity, he's still bringing himself glory in the eternities. Why? Because I'm going to live in eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. Hey, I know that's not popular Christianity. That ain't 21st century Christianity. We're supposed to feel good all the time. We're supposed to be prosperous all the time. It don't work like that, church. Sometimes we're broken. Sometimes the gates of hell do come against us and fall on us. Sometimes life ain't fair. Matter of fact, most time life ain't fair. But understand that there's a sovereign God. If he lets it happen to you, glory in it, relish in it, know that he's bringing together a picture that's much bigger than you and much bigger than me, and you're a little pixel in that picture, and he's orchestrating things somehow for his glory. It don't matter if you understand it. It don't matter if I understand it. We understand God's word and what it says, and we believe what God's word says. God is sovereign. Therefore, I rest in that. I rest in it. Yeah, it's a good response. Hmm. Good response. Hmm. I'm in God's place. Big statement, isn't it? Look at verse 20. An amazing. This is an amazing definition of the saga of Joseph's life. Verse 20, as for you, as for you, my mean, wicked, rotten brothers, as for you, you meant it evil against me. Think about that. You see, when, when, when Joseph was being thrown into the well, them, them 11 brothers wasn't trying to bring glory to God. They were evil. When they traded him off like a dog, at the local sale, they weren't bringing glory to God. They, they, didn't, they weren't honoring God. They weren't trying to. They were acting out their evilness. But what does Joseph say? You meant it for evil. What does, that, what does that say to us this morning? It says this to us. God uses even evil for his glory in our lives. Many times evil things come against us in this world. Hey, how many of you live in this world long enough to know this world's evil? And it ain't getting no better. And, and newsflash, it ain't going to get no better. It's evil. It's evil times in which we live. Do you understand that this month, January, has been set aside as sanctity of life month? What in the world's that about? It's about this. So many unborn babies have been murdered in America that the Christians have, have set aside the month of January to pray for those moms and pray for those dads who have committed those atrocities, to pray for our government who's allowed such atrocities, such a holocaust in America. This is an evil place. It's a wicked place. How does God use that preacher? Man, I wish I could tell you. I don't know. But I know this. In all that goes down that is evil, it's meant for evil. But God, according to Scripture, look, look what it says. Verse 20, as for you, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people's lives. You know, we said this, and boy, it's a true statement. Man, we, we make life all about us. Let's just be honest, guys. We do. We make life all about us. Tomorrow when you get up, is your plans about what you need to do and want to do? Or is your plans about what God wants you to do and needs you to do? Most of us would answer that first answer. Yeah, man, I got to get up. I got to go to work. I got to go shopping. I got to do this. I got to do that. James said, you fool. You don't even know what tomorrow holds. Instead, you should say, if the Lord allows, 
I will go here and go there and stay a year and make money and be prosperous. That's what James said to that brother Jesus. Life's about us. We make it that way. But in reality, life's not about us. See, if life was about you, you'd get to make more choices. Like you'd get to pick your mom and dad. Right? You'd get to pick your parents. You'd get to pick your siblings. Get to, get to make a lot of choices. You know, and the jail ministry that, that goes on through Three Trees, most of the men, and, and I must probably women too, I'm not near as familiar with the, the women's side of that ministry as I am the men, but most of the men that Wayne deals with, they're broken. They're broken because their family's broken. They didn't, most of them, not all of them, there's some that comes from good homes. But by and large, most of those guys have a common denominator, and that's the fact they, didn't raise, they weren't raised in a home where they had a daddy to teach them, to, to, to live it out in front of them, and to instruct them. Well, why are you bringing that up, Brother Tracy? To make this point, those men didn't ask for that. They didn't ask to grow up ignorant of what life was all about. They grew up in a home where they had to figure things out themselves, and guess what? They figured it all wrong. That's why they're addicted to drugs and sin, because life's all about them. But they didn't choose that. It was chosen for them. See, life's not about us. It's about God. Now, as we read this saga of Joseph and it unfolds, uh, our minds kind of, because we love a good story. Who loves a good movie? I'll raise your hands, quit it. You know you do. Uh, the story of Joseph would make a great Netflix series, wouldn't it? I mean, great. It's a saga, man. We love this kind of stuff. But really, the story's not about Joseph. But, but because we love a good story, and because life's about us, when we read a saga like this in the Bible, we immediately get hung up on the pit. We get hung up on the betrayal. We get, bit, we get hung up on the slavery and the prison. We get hung up on all of the scenes that are flashing and never see the big picture. There's a big picture in this saga. Look at verse uh, 22, chapter 50. You there say amen. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. That's a pretty good life, isn't it? Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons. Ephraim was his son. And also the sons of Machir, the sons of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knee. So God, God blessed Joseph. Man, he's seen some grandchildren, some great-grandchildren, and some great-great-grandchildren. He lived a long time, but watch this, verse 24. This is the key to the whole book, or the whole story. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised an oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. What do we learn from that verse? We learn this that all that Joseph went through was not about Joseph. All that God put Joseph through and allowed Joseph to go through was God's way, God's plan to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant that he made with Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12. Your life and my life ain't about us. Your life and my life is about God. We have the privilege of being a piece of the puzzle, a pixel in the picture, where God can move us around. God can orchestrate things with us and through us and in us to bring glory to his name and to fulfill the plan that he has for his kingdom. Are y'all all right? For his kingdom. Therefore, when life hits us in the face, we need to rest in God's sovereignty and understand I'm right where God wants me to be. Unless, unless we're living in sin, habitual sin, and we get our own self there. I hear it all the time. I don't know why God did this to me. Look, Hoss, God didn't do that to you. You did that to you. 
You did that to you. But then there's those things that we don't have any control over. We're right where God wants us to be. There's a bigger picture. There's a bigger plan. It's going to bring him glory. If it doesn't bring him glory here on planet Earth, it'll bring him glory in eternity. And I'm privileged to be a part of it. I'm privileged just to be a small part of it, just a pixel that makes up this vast picture, just a little nip of the puzzle that makes up this vast puzzle called God's kingdom. See, Joseph's life wasn't about Joseph. Joseph's life was about God fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant. Somewhere in our future lies a seven-year tribulation period. That ain't about America. That ain't about Europe. That ain't about Moscow, China, any of the other. That's about Israel. Because God's not through with Israel. It will happen just as the word says it will happen. We're rushing toward that. And God's plan will be done. Rest in his sovereignty. This year, if it comes unwound more than it's unwound, rest in the sovereignty of God. Don't try to take him off the throne and you grab the steering wheel. Rest in his sovereignty. He don't need your advice. He don't need your permission. Just rest in the sovereignty of God, knowing that he is on the throne, that nothing that man can devise can thwart the plans of God for his kingdom. Nothing we can do. God's not reacting to us. God's not reacting to fallen man. God is the causation He's the preeminent one. He is the orchestrator of all things for the glory of his kingdom in your life and mine. Amen or not? Amen. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Tracy Wilson. Thank you so much for being with us uh, via Facebook or YouTube or however you're watching us, whether it be a Wednesday night round pen or a Sunday morning uh, service here at the Cowboy Church. Just wanted to say hello and give you a personal invite to come and be with us here at the Cowboy Church. Uh, there's three options for you. Sunday mornings, we have a 9 a.m. service, uh, and then a second service at 10.30 a.m. And then on Wednesday nights, uh, we do what we call a round pin Bible study, which is just getting into the heart of God's Word and studying it for all it's worth. We would love to meet with you uh, here in person at the Cowboy Church. We're so thankful for uh, technology. We've gotten uh, comments on our uh, sermons and Bible studies uh, all the way from Africa. And so we're so thankful. But uh, we do want to invite you here with us uh, to be uh, in person, in-house at the Cowboy Church. You know, the Bible says this about salvation. The Bible says clearly in Ephesians 2.8 that salvation is by grace through faith not of works, so no man can boast. Our prayer is that through these messages and through these Bible studies, uh, that the Word of God would uh, find its place in your heart. The promise is that God's Word will not return void. So we want to make ourselves available to you uh, for anything that we can do to help you. If you have questions about this Jesus that we preach about, this Jesus that we serve, this Jesus that we know as our Savior and that the Bible declares as the only Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. If you would have a question about that, if we could help you with that, or if God deals with your heart through one of our sermons or Bible studies, and you've responded to that, and you've put your hope and trust, and you've committed to follow Jesus Christ, we would love to celebrate with you about that. We'd love to talk with you about that help you in any way that we can. If you're watching, then obviously you have Facebook or uh, the availability of YouTube. Uh, if we can do anything, I would love for you to personally message me on Facebook. And I would love to correspond with you about this. God is able, and He is able to meet all of our needs. He has extended His grace to us uh, through the offer of forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. I hope that you have taken advantage of that. I hope that you belong to Christ. And please take advantage of Three Trees Cowboy Church. Being here in person or just allowing us to message with you and help you in any way we can. Until then, until we see you in person or we see that message, God bless you and thank you for being with us.